this k becomes a function of the two variables, and it turns out to be uh, the integral kernel of the evolution operator. So namely, you should take this Hamiltonian function, quantize it. So here, everything is done canonically by uh, Schrodinger quantization. So you quantize it as a, as a differential operator. And, uh, and then uh, you have the, the evolution operator, so the exponential of ih bar times the time difference times the operator h hat applied to some wave function psi. So this, at the time q out, can be obtained as a convolution of this uh, integral kernel with the, the wave function at the, pos the position, the position q in. Okay, and well, Feynman observation was that you can, well, actually it was already Dirac observation, but well, it was finally formalized and written in detail by Feynman, that you can obtain this evolution operator, the integral kernel evolution operator by integrating over plus. And okay, there are several way to make sense of these and to get this formula. Uh, well, Feynman's way in the book was just to discretize and to show that there is a limit of the discretization where these two results coincide. And there is a, the, the, the uh, per perturbative way, namely you, you, you define this functional integral as perturbation theory around the classical solution, you spend it in Feynman diagrams, and then you check that the result is the asymptotics of, of, of this operator. Okay, so this is a, like the first uh, observation. So uh, I already mentioned the semi-classical approximation for this computation. So this is done as follows. So you pick some, um, well, for simplicity, assume, let me assume that there is a unique classical solution uh, joining the, the position Q in at time T in to the position Q out at time T out. Okay, if there are many solutions, then you have to sum over all of them. There is some extra complication. So let me assume that there is just one solution. And I will denote this solution as P bar Q bar. So P bar Q bar is a map from the time interval to phase space, which solves the Hamilton uh, equations for this Hamiltonian. And then you rewrite your pass P and Q as uh, the, the classical solution plus a fluctuation that I will denote with hat. And then formally assuming that these are, uh, well, you can manipulate this integral and uh, you did some formal Lebesgue measure, you can just make a translation. So you, you make a change of variables from the P Q variables to the P hat Q hat variable. It's just a translation by this P bar Q bar variables. So the integrals becomes an integral over the P hat Q hat variable and what you can do is, uh, well, you can extract uh, the sim well, some part that depends on P bar Q bar. So namely, I define this Hamilton Jacobi action as a function of Q in and Q out, just as the evaluation of the classical action on the solution P bar Q bar. And then this S hat is just the difference between the action and the Hamilton Jacobi action, now written in the uh, P hat Q hat variable, okay? So the result here is that I can extract this vector, and then I still have this functional integral, and then this functional integral is in, in well, well, computed formally by saddle point approximation. So the point that since I subtracted this classical part and P bar Q bar was a classical solution that is a critical point of the action, this difference as hat start at, with the, at the second order. Okay, and so you can assume that well, the second order is non-degenerate, and so you can do a saddle point approximation formally, and this gives Feynman diagram. But this term here is a semi-classical contribution and you see this is just the exponential of I over H bar of the hamilton jacobi action, okay? So hamilton jacobi action was well produced by, 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 by well, I think by, 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 by Jacobi uh, this, this way. And this is a solution of Hamilton's principle, well, of, well, hamilton jacobi equation. So it's called Hamilton's principal function. So we'll return to this in a moment. Um, so the idea is the following. Take your classical action and consider a, a variation. This is a, how you compute the equation of motion. So when you compute the variation, uh, you have to integrate by parts. So there are some boundary terms that for a, a, an action of the form I described before, so maybe here, PDQ minus some terms that does not contain derivatives, there are boundary terms that are just P delta Q at the initial and the final point, and then there is another term where you integrate by parts to isolate the variation. And this is the term that is responsible for, for the Euler-Lagrange equation. So the Euler-Lagrange equation are the solution of, of this. So there are the, 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 the paths that uh, um, make this term equal to zero. And so if you now apply 
uh, where you define the Hamilton Jacobi action as evaluation of the action on the solution, when you take the, the variation of the Hamilton Jacobi action, this term disappears because now we are in a solution. And so you only see these two terms. So now, uh, well, Q evaluated at the out is by definition Q out. Q evaluated at Q in is by definition Q in. So these are the variables Q in and Q out. And on the other hand, here you still have P evaluated at the out and P evaluated in. So Q out and Q in are boundary condition that determine your classical solution. Your classical solution is a path. In particular, you can take the P part of this path and you can evaluate it at the initial time and the final time. Okay, so saying that the differential Hamilton Jacobi function as this form simply means that you can obtain the momentum at the final time as minus the derivative of the Hamilton Jacobi action by the final position and the momentum at the initial time as the derivative of the uh, Hamilton Jacobi action at the initial uh, position. So, so this is a, a actually what you need to solve the Hamilton Jacobi equation. I will not discuss that. I just want to com com well, comment a bit on the geometrical interpretation. Uh, these equations uh, are just saying that the function S H J, the Hamilton Jacobi action, is a generating function for uh, the graph of the Hamiltonian flow. Okay. So I think well, these are post some seminars. So I think this should should be uh, should be clear. So what I me mean, let me say a little bit more here. So the generating interpretation. So you have your, your Hamiltonian function. You can consider Hamilton Jacobi. Uh, sorry, Hamilton's equation. You, you, well, you, well, this gives you some the Hamilton vector field of your Hamiltonian function, and you can compute its flow. Its flow from time t in to times t out, right? So this is a map from the cotangent bundle of Rn to the cotangent bundle of Rn. So my, my phase space. I mean, for simplicity in this talk, I only assume that my phase space is a cotangent bundle of Rn. And uh, then you can take the graph of this flow. And uh, this is automatically a Lagrangian submanifold of the product of t star Rn and T star n, where you have to change the sign of the symplectic form on one of the two factors. Okay, so uh, then, uh, uh, well, saying that this uh, uh, Hamilton Jacobi action is a generating function simply means that uh, you can now, uh, well, view this product of cotangent bundle as a cotangent bundle of R n cross R n with coordinates Q in and Q out. You can take the differential of this function and you take its graph, which essentially exactly means saying that the, the p's are equal up to sign to the derivative of the generating function by the q variables. Okay. And it turns out that, so essentially, this computation tells you that the graph of the differential of this function is the same as the graph of the Hamiltonian flow. Okay. So this is the, the main property of the Hamilton Jacobi action. Okay, so uh, what I've done here is to choose a polarization, namely I rewritten my, this product of symplectic manifolds as a cotangent bundle of some chosen base, which is Rn cross Rn with the Q coordinates. You could have chosen, make it, well, you could have made a different choice. Essentially you could have rewritten this, uh, this whole symplectic manifold as some other cotangent bundle. And then uh, uh, you could have looked for some other generating function of, of, of this, uh, L. So suppose, for example, that uh, uh, I change my coordinates, small p, small q, to some other coordinate, capital P, capital Q, by a symplectomorphism. And actually, let me assume that there is a generating function for this uh, symplectomorphism. So namely, there is a function f of the small q variables and the capital uh, q variable, such that the potential of the uh, symplectic forms are related by this formula. So small p, this small q, it should be capital P D capital Q plus the differential of this function, okay? And so, and then, well, from this formula, you can read how to compute small p and capital P from uh, small q and capital Q, okay? And so now the idea is to fix the small q variables at the initial endpoint and the capital Q variable and the final endpoint, okay? So this is another, uh, polarization here. And what I'm looking for is another generating function of, of this uh, uh, capital L. And this is obtained essentially again by, well, the, the Hamilton-Jacobin procedure. The only thing you have to do is that you have to modify 
your initial action functional by this uh, boundary term. Namely, you subtract this function f evaluated at final endpoint. So, namely, you take uh, q evaluated at t out and capital Q evaluated at the, the, the PQ variables at t out. Okay. Now, if you take a variation of this new action, which I denote as with as, as f, to remember that I use this function f here, you will see that again you get uh, some uh, bulk term, which are again the responsible for the same uh, Euler-Lagrange equation. You still have this uh, small p delta q term at the initial point. This is the boundary term as before, but at the final endpoint, you have the small p delta q term by, by integration by part. You have the delta f term by this term here, and the two add up to give you the capital P delta capital Q term, okay? So now you get this final term here. And so this tells you that now if you evaluate this on a solution, the Euler Lagrange term disappear, you get this equation, which tells you that now, uh, well, again, uh, the, the, the small p at the initial point is minus the derivative of, of s at the, uh, the initial small q. But now, uh, well, you, this is a function of, of the capital Q at the final end point. If you take the derivative with respect to capital Q at the final uh, uh, end point, you get capital P. So again, this, uh, so this new hamilton jacobi uh, action is again a generating function for the graph of the Hamiltonian flow, but now with respect to this new polarization. Okay, so this essentially means that, uh, well, uh, essentially now we have transformed our cotangent bundle over n from the coordinate small p mod q to the other coordinate capital P capital Q. Now the simplest example is when I just want to switch the p and the q variable. So that is, I mean, I define capital Q to be small p and capital P to be minus q. And in this case, the generating function as a function of small q and capital Q is just a product of capital Q and small q. And so in this case, the deformed action as f is just s minus pq evaluated at the, the final time, okay? Okay, so these were uh, the, this was the, the background. I think, the, well, I think this should be known almost to everybody. And uh, this was, some, some background I wanted to fix because what uh, we, we, we do now is to extend this story to, uh, well, first of all, to degenerate Lagrangians. So uh, we'll come to, to that in a moment, what it, what it means. So essentially, uh, this means that there will be some Lagrange multipliers in the, in, the, in, the, in the Lagrangian. Moreover, we are interested in infinite dimensional systems, which means that, uh, well, these T star Rn will become some infinite dimensional uh, uh, symplectic manifolds, actually, well, for this talk will be some infinite dimensional uh, symplectic uh, vector space. And moreover, we want to uh, discuss the quantization part. So uh, again, we want to, well, construct the, the integral kernel of the evolution operator as uh, some functional integral and we want to show that under some assumption, we get again uh, the exponential of the Hamilton-Jacobi equation, possibly times quantum corrections, okay? And this will, will be done uh, uh, in, in this setting with the general Lagrangians, possibly with infinite dimensional target, and that's it. Now, let me discuss this problem here. So if uh, the Lagrangian is degenerate, uh, the functional integral as I define it in the first slide no longer works because when you right, put perturb around the classical solution, uh, uh, well, maybe let me go back. Remember we had this uh, idea here to perturb around the, the classical solution and then to consider this integral on this new functional S hat, which is the action minus the action evaluated on the critical point. And the point that if the action is degenerate, uh, this quadratic term is degenerate. This is essentially the same, okay? So we cannot do the, the saddle point approximation. And so for this, well, you have to do what is usually done in field theory in this case, uh, to, uh, well, discuss, well, introduce some gauge fixing and discuss how the result depends on gauge fixing, okay? So this is the first question I want to answer. And the second question is, well, what happens in, in the case when you apply this to chern simon theory? And in particular, the question is whether there are quantum correction here or whether you just get the semi-classical result. Okay. 
And uh, well, there is uh, some hidden questions that well we have to answer before we start doing anything. Is okay. What, what, what are the space in which Q in and Q out actually live? Okay, and we'll go back in a moment. Okay, so uh, it turns out that uh, all these questions. Q0, Q1, and Q2 are solved nicely in the so-called BV, but BFV formalism, uh, which is a formalism introduced by Batani Vilkovisky, Batani Frakin Vilkovisky, and put together uh, well, in collaboration with uh, Pavel Miof and Nikolai Rashitikin, which allows you to make sense of this functional integral in the presence of symmetry or for degenerate actions, and to produce, um, well, the analog of, of, of the state which uh, now is no longer uniquely defined because you have to make a gauge fixing, but is still uh, under control. So namely, uh, what happens is that, uh, uh, well, instead of just having some, some, uh, some space in which this uh, K live, this space will become some complex with some co-boundary operator omega. And it turns out that the state, so now we'll call it psi, so it will be the analog of, of this, is uh, in, the, in the kernel of this omega, and is defined up to something in the image of omega. So this is what happens when you change the gauge fixing. So as a result, uh, the, the cohomology class of this psi is well defined and this, this is what give you the, 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 well, the physical answer. Okay, so uh, in particular, this omega cohomology is some way, uh, at least some formal perturbative way of defining the Hilbert space quantization of uh, the reduced system. So having a degenerate uh, Lagrangian means that there are some constraints and some symmetries. So your phase space uh, is defined by some, some symplectic reduction and uh, you should quantize this reduced symplectic space. And uh, this BFV formalism gives you some cohomological way to do it. Namely, you first quantize some larger uh, um, symplectic manifolds, actually super symplectic manifold, and then you recover the, the Hilbert space corresponding to the reduced system by this omega cohomology. So in particular, in the application of uh, chern simon theory, uh, the reduced phase space is a space of flat connection on a surface modular gauge transformation. And uh, instead of quantizing these uh, complicated um, space, which also has singularities, you keep all connection at some extra graded variables and uh, do the quantization there. And then uh, you get some graded quantization with this co-boundary operator and the cohomology is somehow, some, in some sense, the, the quantization of the reduction. Okay. So uh, in particular, if you, well, what, now let me tell you a bit more what I mean uh, to do this system, one dimensional system with the infinite dimensional target. I, I mean, I'm only, only going to consider infinite dimensional target actually correspond to some field theory in higher dimension. So let me well, do the case of Chern-Simon theory. So Chern-Simon theory means the following. Uh, you do Chern-Simon theory on the three manifold, which has the form an interval capital I cross some surface sigma. And then you interpret this interval I as time interval. Now, the fields of Chern-Simon theory are connections. So like if you choose some trivialization are one forms on I cross sigma. And uh, well, you think of them as maps from I to differential forms in sigma or one forms in I taking values in differential forms in sigma. So this way uh, you have a system that lives on I and as is the target, the differential form of sigma. So the, the target becomes infinite dimensional. It's no longer T star Rn, it's all uh, differential form of sigma. And uh, in particular, well, one forms on sigma. And this is symplectic space, which actually is related to, to, to this. Okay. Then what you do is, okay, you want to uh, construct this evolution operator on a cylinder. So we, we, we focus in this talk on field theory on, on, on cylinders. It is on I cross some manifold. And uh, well, since the theory like uh, chern simon theory is topological, uh, the result is invariant under, under the, well, the feomorphism in particular is invariant under reparameterization of this interval. And so in particular, this tells you that, uh, well, the, the, the state or the class of, 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 uh, of this uh, evolution operator K you get should be the identity operator. Okay, because everything should be invariant under the parameterization of, of, of interval and uh, actually it does not depend on the interval. Uh, the point that you get anyway, some interesting answer because well, this K itself, of course, represent the identity operator, right? But uh, uh, well, uh, it's the identity operator in quantum mechanics 
uh, is defined up to uh, projectivization. So there is some phase, and this phase uh, is, is interesting. Actually, this phase will be the Hamilton Jacobi action. So this phase is interesting. Moreover, you can start this K before going down to the omega homology, and this also might contain some interesting information. And in particular, let me now come to, 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 to the, well, some of the results before going to the technical part. So for example, if we apply our construction to three-dimensional, uh, well, non abelian chen simon theory, it turns out that, uh, uh, well, this uh, evolution, this phase here is essentially the gauge of s domino with an action. So we recover the gauge of s domino with an action from, from this procedure. And uh, well, in addition, we show that there are no uh, quantum corrections, at least if we, well, in, in our uh, gauge fixing. And another interesting example, which actually uh, was the, well, the, the original system we consider, well, all, all, well, I should say that uh, well, we, all these work started from a, a suggestion of um, Samson Shatashvili that said that well, we should be able to, to use this BV formalism to, to study this problem. He had approached a few years ago with Gregor Asimov. So the problem is the following. You take seven dimensional uh, Chen Simon theory, with say a billion, and uh, you study it with some polarization and uh, Gerasimus and Shatashvili showed that this is related to the Kodaira Spencer action, also known as a BCOV action. So let me say a bit more here. So the, 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 the theory as this action here, so it's an integral over a seven dimensional manifold of C DC, where C is some three form. So the fields here are three forms. And, um, and the, the, the action is very simple. It's just CD, this seven form, C DC. Now you assume that your seven dimensional manifold is an interval cross sigma. So now sigma is six dimensional. And in addition, you assume that six sigma is a Calabi-Yau manifold. Okay, and then you have two interesting polarization on, on, on the, well, you just take the three forms on the, this uh, um, Calabi-Yau threefold. And uh, well, uh, there is one, well, rather obvious uh, polarization, which we call the linear polarization, which is obtained just using the, the complex structure. And you just essentially, oh, happened. A second. Is it getting smaller? No. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, yeah, one possibility is just to use the complex structure on sigma. So you can split uh, the three forms into three, zero, two, one, one, two, and zero, three. And then you say that the Q variables are the three, zero, and two, one forms, and the P variables are the one, two, and zero, three form. Okay. But there is also another a very interesting null. No linear polarization, well, no linear in sense is no linear with respect to, to this polarization, which was introduced by Hitchin. And uh, this uses the whole Calabi Yau structure. So uh, essentially, uh, well, the, the, you say that the, the Q variables are written in this form. So omega zero is the Calabi Yau form, and then they are parameterized by some function rho and by some Beltrami differential mu. So this parameterizes the, the, the Q variables, and then you can find out what the, the P variables are. And uh, what uh, Gerasim and Sasha video observed was that if you compute the Hamilton Jacobi action for this very simple action using these two polarization on the initial and final endpoint, the result is precisely this Kodaira Spencer action. So, this is the action whose uh, critical points are the deformation of the, 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 the complex, complex structure. And this is also well known as a BCOB action in, in, uh, in string theory. And well, one question they had was that whether this is a semi-classical result uh, persists at the quantum level and how it uh, stands to the quantum level. So many, for example, the question is what are, are there quantum corrections? Of course, these, uh, uh, well, this question uh, depends on the quantization scheme, depends on the gate fixing and so on. Uh, what we show is that there is a quantization scheme using batani vilkovsky with a particular uh, gauge fixing where the quantum corrections disappear. Of course, you might say that, well, this series of billion, so. Uh, Alberto? Yes? Uh, so, so how is it? You're saying that whether you not you have quantum corrections depends on your uh, on your choices. So, so that- the, Yes, but it depends in a stupid way. For example, you can change the gauge fixing and then quantum correction appear. But okay, if you go down to the cohomology, they disappear again. Yeah, so, so for, so to say, physical quantities or gauge invariant quantities or whatever they are, for gauge, gauge invariant questions, the answers normally should not depend on the gauge, yes, right? Yeah, 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 yes. 
So does it mean does it mean that the question about quantum corrections is uh, not uh, not 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 a uh, gauge invariant question? Is it well, the point is that okay, there are several points. So one thing is that what we can check is the invariance under deformation of our gauge fixing. Of course, there might be some non-equivalent gauge fixing where quantum correction uh, appear. Okay. So what we show is that well. Well, essentially, well, we take the, the, the Lorentz gauge for some metric, and then we show that for any metric and for any, any deformation of the Lorentz gauge, there are no quantum corrections. Thank you. Okay? But of course, there might be some non-equivalent gauge fixing. Mm -hmm. uh, there is another uh, source for the, the, the correction is uh, uh, some regularization scheme. So for example, uh, well, where you well, when you quantize, for example, you have to choose an ordering. Or when you do uh, the, the, the path integral, you have to uh, choose, for example, how to regularize tadpoles. So this, this well, we, we make some natural choice, uh, which is very, very simple and works. But in principle, one might think of well, choosing some different uh, uh, regularization, some, some different way of regularizing the tadpoles where the, where the, the, the tadpoles reappear. May, may, okay, may this should also be an artificial way of making them reappear. Uh, uh, Alberto, may, may I ask a provocative question? Mm -hmm. Now you're kind of speaking as a physicist. Uh, so, okay, the, the mathematical theorem is that there is a, a way to, uh, uh, to define this uh, functional integral perturbatively. And the theorem is that uh, uh, there is a gauge fixing with no quantum correction. And then the next theorem is that uh, well, for, for any deformation of this gauge fixing, there are no quantum corrections. Okay, so, so, sounds good. Sounds more reassuring. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay, so okay, so now let me uh, start discussing uh, the, the back up to the second part uh, where I discuss the details. So first of all, let me discuss the classical part. Uh, so here is a kind of degenerate system we con we consider. So we still have the PDQ part. So here I always write PDQ, but of course the target could be uh, well higher dimensional. It means be a sum of the PQ variables, could also be infinite dimensional. Uh, we'll briefly discuss on that. So now just suppose that it's well, finite dimensional. So there is a PDQ term in, in the action. And then we have a collection of functions H alpha that depend on the PQ variables and some Lagrange multiplier E alpha. So here, since well, I want to integrate, I don't want to introduce explicitly uh, a parameterization, I assume that these Lagrange multiplier E alpha are one forms on the interval. Okay, so this is the action, okay? And uh, well, okay, in this simple example, there is no HDT term. Uh, actually, you can add it. I will not for simplicity because well, basically it will not apply to chain Simon theory where there is no the HDT term. You can actually recover it from this description if you specialize one of the E alpha to be DT, okay? So the alpha will no longer be a Lagrange multiplier. You can specify that it is some fixed DT variable, okay? But for simplicity, let's stay uh, at this level, okay? And then, uh, well, if we change the polarization, so for example, let me do the simple case where I, I want just want the, the, to want to swap the P and Q variables, then you, again, you subtract this uh, generating function F at the, the final endpoint, and so you define this as F, okay? So this is the system. And uh, well, the system, you see that it is degenerate because, uh, well, first of all, in addition to the PQ variables, now you also have the E variable, so you have to make sense also what is the symplectic structure and well, they do not appear on the boundary when you integrate by parts. So they're not really boundary variables. So the symplectic structure is still given by just the, the, the phase space with P and Q coordinates, okay? But uh, there is uh, some non, well, the, the only Lagrange equations imply that the H alpha should be equal to zero. So you have these, in addition, these algebraic equation and uh, the result is that if you perturb around the solution, you get some, uh, well, some singular fashion. Okay, uh, there is some consistency condition uh, for, for this system to, to make sense. Uh, I will not enter into detail. I just give you the condition. You may find them very, very natural. So the condition is that, uh, uh, well, these uh, function H alpha are in evolution. So namely, uh, uh, they, they generate a, a, a Lie ideal in the Poisson algebra of functions. So in other words, uh, explicit, more explicitly, there is some set of functions, F alpha, beta, gamma, such that the Poisson bracket of H alpha with H beta is equal to the sum over gamma of F alpha, beta, gamma, H gamma, okay? 
So this, this is the, the condition. And uh, I will go back in a moment to the uh, geometric interpretation. Of course, you, you know that this is related to cosotropics and manifold, but uh, at the moment they're just algebraic. I'm not saying that these are regular constraints. So, so now let's study just the, the, the classical problem associated to these actions. So first of all, let's compute the other Lagrange equation. So you have to take variation with respect to the P variables and you get this equation that dq is equal to sum over alpha, e alpha, dh alpha over dp. You can take the variation with respect to q. Here you have to integrate by parts. And so you get the dp is equal to minus sum over e alpha, partial derivative of h alpha with respect to dq. And you can take the variation with respect to the Lagrange multiplier e alpha. And so you get h alpha equal to zero for all alpha. Okay. Now, as you see here, uh, these two uh, sets of equations are a different nature. So first, this uh, first set of equations they call evolution equation involve some, some derivative. Whereas the second set of equations, the constraints are purely algebraic, okay? So from now on, I will re refer to this first set of equation as the evolution equation and to the second set of equation as constraints, okay? So in terms of the field of the theory, the evolution equation arise when you take variation with respect to well, what they call the physical fields. So these are the fields that determine the symplectic structure on the boundary, so the PQ variables. Whereas the constraints are the variation with respect to these E alpha fields that uh, do not appear on the boundary. So these are the Lagrange multiply. Okay, so this is the whole structure. Okay, in particular, uh, if you take, if you evaluate some H alpha on, on a solution of, of the evolution equation, so forget the constraints in a moment, just consider the evolution equation, take a solution of the evolution equation, evaluate some H alpha on, to evaluate the H alpha on the solution and take its differential, okay? So then by, by the chain rule and by this uh, relation, you will see that the differential of, of H alpha will be minus alpha sum over gamma, F alpha beta gamma, H gamma also evaluated on the solution times E beta, okay? So this is a, uh, an equation. And uh, well, this equation is, is very, well, uh, well, it's a, a very interesting consequence Namely, tells you that the differential of the H alpha on a solution are hmm, linear combinations of uh, the H of the uh, all the H's also evaluated on solution, which means that uh, if you, this, the constraints are satisfied at some point, for example, the initial point, right, uh, then the H is equal to zero, so the constraints are automatically satisfied at every point. Okay, so this means that. Well, in principle, the other Lagrange equation tells you that you have to satisfy the constraint H alpha at every, for the field, for the PQ variables evaluated at every time T in the, in the interval, but actually it's enough to, to check the constraint as the initial point, okay? And then it's automatically satisfied uh, everywhere. Okay, now we uh, introduce uh, the notion of evolution relation. So this is the capital L. So this is a generalization of, of the graph of the Hamiltonian flow that we had in the non-degenerate case. Okay, so remember that in the degenerate case, uh, the, the, the other Lagrange equation define um, um, Hamilton's action. You can compute uh, the Hamiltonian vector field of the Hamiltonian function, compute its flow, and, uh, and then uh, computes uh, its graph in, in T star Rn cross T, T, T star Rn, where you change the, the, uh, the, the sign of synthetic structure here, and this graph was a Lagrangian sum manifold. Here instead, we, we don't have a flow, but we still have the solution. So what you can do is, well, take uh, solutions in the bulk and see what uh, initial and final uh, uh, endpoints they can have, okay? So, so basically you take all points in T star n cross T star n that can be endpoints of a solution to the um, Euler-Lagrange equation, is evolution equation plus constraints, okay? And uh, you can show that this is still a Lagrangian submanifold, okay? It's no longer a graph in general. If you have the constraint, it's no longer a graph, but it's still Lagrangian, okay? So this is what we call the, the evolution relation and this replaces uh, the, 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 the Hamiltonian flow. Now, uh, well, this is this is the seminar, I can give you uh, the nice geometrical interpretation of this. So assume that the function at alpha are actually regular constraints, which means that they are independent and their differentials are also independent or in other words, that the, 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 the zero locus is a submanifold. Uh, then, well, uh, on C, you have the characteristic distribution, which is, well, 
either the, the, the kernel of the restriction of the symplectic form or uh, the span of the Hamiltonian vector fields of the constraints H, H alpha. And then you can see that this L is nothing else than the pairs in C cross C that can be connected by a path that is a tangent to this distribution. Uh, Alberto? Yes? I think there is a question. Mm -hmm. Ted, do, do, do you yeah. want to uh, uh, Hi, Alberto. So uh, hi. just quickly, uh, it looks like you have a, a physical viewpoint. You have free system with constraints, like, yes, correct? Yes, for simplicity, yes. yes. I mean, yes, you so can you don't have actual the, Hamiltonian. You, yeah, you can introduce it, yeah. Yeah, you can, but for simplicity, I'm uh, excluding it here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now you can introduce it, of course. Uh, and uh, I mean, I'm not doing it because, okay, just want to focus on the constraint part. And when, mm -hmm. when we discuss the Simon theory, there is no Hamiltonian. So this fits very well. But of course, you can introduce the Hamiltonian. You can either introduce it explicitly, or actually, you can first make this discussion and then realize that actually there is a trick to promote one of the Lagrange multiplier, actually, to fix one of these Lagrange multiplier to be dt. So you introduce a specific okay. time and then the one of the h alpha becomes the, the evolution. Mm -hmm. Of course, okay. uh, well, this works if that h alpha exactly commutes with all the others. Okay, so what you, what you will have is a constraints in involution and the Hamiltonian that exactly commutes with all the other constraints. So that is a typical situation. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, does, your, does, does it answer your question? Yeah, sure, thank you. Okay, so again, so geometric interpretation is the following. So you have, so the, the constraints define a quasotropic submanifold. Uh, the quasotropic submanifold is endowed with uh, uh, this distribution, which is uh, um, involutive. And what you can do is to consider pass along the distribution, or say the pass on the leaves of the distribution. Okay, and then you can see that this L that I define here using the, well, the, 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 the Euler-Lagrange equation is the same as the L that I consider here, namely pairs in C cross C that can be connected by a path on the leaves, on some leaf of, of this distribution. Okay, so this is now a, a submanifold of C cross C, but you see C inside T star Rn, so this becomes a, a submanifold in T star Rn cross T star Rn. Okay. I mean, I'm assuming it is some, it might be singular, but for simplicity, well, in the, actually in the case we consider it is a submanifold. Okay, now what I want to do is to find a generating function for, for, uh, for this Lagrangian submanifold with respect to some polarization. And uh, well, the claim is that this should, should be given by some Hamilton-Jacobi construction. So namely the correct Hamilton-Jacobi action corresponding to, to this problem is the restriction of the action function of S to solution of the evolution equations. So namely, you only consider this equation. You forget the constraint, okay? And you just evaluate S on solution of the evolution equations. And uh, well, this S now defend, depends on the initial and final variables. So I think uh, here I decided uh, for simplicity uh, here right, to, to use the p variables in, 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 well, as base variables in the, in the at final endpoint. So this S will de depend on Q at the initial point and P at the final point, but it also depends on all the Lagrange multipliers. So it's still the functionals right, because it's the Lagrange multiplier as I want forms, okay? But the claim is that uh, this, uh, well, new functional is a generating function for L, okay? So notice uh, two things that first of all, uh, L is defined using all Euler Lagrange equation, that is evolution and constraints, whereas the Hamilton Jacobi action is defined using only the evolution equations. Okay, here you don't impose the constraints. And uh, well, the reason uh, why this works is very simple. Uh, well, if when you compute a variation of, uh, of this uh, Hamilton Jacobi action, again, uh, you don't see the uh, Euler Lagrange term because, um, well, you, you don't see part of the Euler Lagrange term because you're, you're evaluating on a solution evolution equation. You see the boundary term, you call it to integrate by part, but you still see, see a part of the Euler Lagrange term, right? So this is the Euler Lagrange term uh, corresponding to the constraints or to the, the variation with respect to the E alpha. So this term is still there because I do not uh, impose the constraints, okay? 
So if I had imposed the constraints, I would have gotten just Q, QDP and PDQ at the final endpoints. Okay, so this would, be, would have been rather trivial, but if you don't impose a constraint, you still get this term. And now uh, there is a simple remark. So remember here, this is a functional of these one forms, but there is a simple remark, namely that this uh, functional actually depends on, well, finitely many invariants of these one forms. Uh, well, the result actually will be obvious the moment I tell you, but let me uh, tell you how to come to it. So the idea, remember, that once you evaluate the, the H alphas on evolution equation, you have this equation here. And this tells you that if this variation delta E alpha is of this form, so the differential of some function C alpha plus this uh, linear combination of E beta and C gamma, and this function C vanishes at the end points, then this term is zero, this variation is zero, okay? So this means that actually, well, you can now uh, change your one forms this way. Why this happens? Okay, and you get the same result. So finally, this means that this hamilton jacobi action actually depends only on the uh, initial Q variables, final P variables, and the class of this one form modulo these transformations. Okay, so which we call gauge transformation, we'll see that uh, well, in some in one particular case, they, these are exactly uh, gauge transformation as, as you well, usually understand them. Okay, so this S hat is this hamilton jacobi action, but uh, for E in the, in the given class, in some given class, okay? Okay, and then what happens is that, well, this equation now tells you the following, that you can recover P at the initial time as a, a derivative of the hamilton jacobi action with respect to Q at the initial time. You can get Q at the final uh, time here, by taking minus the derivative of this Hamilton equation with respect to P at the final uh, endpoint, comes from here. But you have still this term here, which tells you that uh, um, uh, the derivative of SF with respect to uh, the Lagrange multiplier, and actually is enough to take the, the class, is zero. Okay, so now we have the three, three set of equations. So this first two set of equations determine the P and the Q variables in terms of, of the, the others. And in addition, you have some more equations, okay? And this, the statement is that this is uh, a generating function for, for this L, or well, for, for this L here, okay? Notice that uh, previously, we only had these two equations, and these two equations were enough to determine all the, the uh, well, to, well, to determine the graph. Now, these equations do not determine a graph. This, this system is still underdetermined. In addition, you have these additional equations that make a uh, solution uh, to these equations into a Lagrangian submanifold, okay? And this Lagrangian submanifold is precisely this uh, uh, evolution relation here, okay? So this is uh, what Alan, in his book with Bates called the generalized generating function. So it's a generating, it's a generating function that depends on uh, some variables on the base of your cotangent bundle and some additional variables, okay? And uh, you, you have this additional equation here. So, well, there is some geometric interpretation for this, namely what you're doing, you are extending your cotangent bundle with some other cotangent bundle. You have some generating function of a Lagrangian sum manifold there. Then you set to zero the momenta of the additional uh, cotangent bundle, which is this equation here. And this turns out to be uh, under reduction, you do this uh, quasotropic reduction. Uh, this gives you a Lagrangian sum manifold of the original cotangent bundle. Okay, but algebraically, this is written uh, in terms of these equations. Okay, so this is what I will refer to as a generalized generating function. Okay, so the proposition, uh, which I uh, essentially proved here, is that the Hamilton Jacobi action, which is defined by evaluating the action on the solution of the evolution equations only is a generalized generating function for the evolution relation, okay? Which uh, accounts for both the evolution uh, equation and the constraints. And moreover, this hamilton jacobi uh, action depends on only on gauge classes of Lagrange multipliers, okay? Now, uh, let consider the case where these uh, uh, functions are actually constant. So 
uh, this is actually the case of shared Simon theory. Uh, what does this case mean? So first of all, uh, this means that this equation, this consistent equation that I had here, simply say that uh, the H alphas are the component of an equivariant momentum map. Okay? And these F alpha beta gamma are the uh, structural constants for some of the algebra. And uh, moreover, what you have here is the usual uh, gauge transformation for a connection. So here, uh, if you say the geometrically, you can interpret the E alpha as a component of the connection one form and this transformation as a gauge transformation. So in particular, this means that now uh, the space of a gauge classes of this Lagrange multiplier is essentially the, the source simply connected, uh, sorry, but the simply connected the group integrating your D algebra, okay? because this is, well, E now is a connection on the interval and is defined up to gauge transformation that are trivial at the end point. So the only invariant is the, the parallel transport from the initial to the final end point, which is a, an element of the group, but actually of the simply connected uh, the group, okay? So this would be uh, the, the, the construction. Okay, now let me move on. So the next uh, task is to compute this hamilton jacobi action. Of course, in general, you cannot because well, it's very complicated, but we are interested in simple cases, namely, for example, when the, 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 the constraints are linear functions or when the constraints are fine in both variables. These are the two relevant cases for chain simon theory. And in these two cases, you can compute everything exactly. So let me start with the case where the constraints are a linear, okay? So what, what I have here, I assume that I have a, uh, well, some set V alpha of vectors and some set W alpha of covectors and uh, each H alpha is of the form P paired with V alpha plus W alpha paired with Q, okay? So these are the constraints. Then the, the, well, the Poisson bracket of two linear constraint is, uh, is constant. So the only way it is a linear combination of a linear constraint constraints is when all the uh, F alpha beta gamma are actually equal to zero. Okay, so this is a special case of the case where the, 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 the structural functions are, are constant and well, actually they are zero. So this means that the D algebra is, is a billion. And this means that well, the simply connected group is just R to some power K number of Lagrange multipliers. Okay, so this will be the space of the Lagrange multiplier uh, modulo gauge transformation. Okay. Uh, but in addition, we want to check that these H alpha are the component of an equivalent momentum map. That is that H alpha Poisson bracket H beta should be equal to zero for all alpha beta. And well, if you do this simple computation, this tells you that the pairing of W alpha with V beta should be the same as the pairing of W beta with V alpha for all alpha and all beta. Or in other words, this means that the matrix A alpha beta obtained by pairing W alpha with V beta is symmetric. Okay. So this is equivalent to saying that uh, these H alphas commute with each other. Now the action is explicitly written this way, is PDQ minus E alpha PV alpha minus E alpha W alpha Q. Okay, now the, the, the well, one evolution equation by the variation with respect to P says that DQ is equal to E alpha V alpha. So you can solve this equation because, uh, right, uh, well, for some choice of E alpha, the V alpha constant. So this says that Q at some time T is Q at the initial time, Q in, plus the integral of this one form from T in to T, okay? Now, let me introduce uh, this new variable tau alpha. This is just the integral of E alpha from the initial time to time T, right? And then, well, you can rewrite this as Q in plus, plus tau alpha V alpha, okay? This tau alpha is now is a function of time. Uh, you can recover E alpha just by differentiating uh, T alpha with respect to the variable T, okay? And so now we can easily compute the evaluation of S on the solution because first of all, uh, you see here, these first two terms are both uh, linear in P, right? So they are exactly equal to P times DQ minus E alpha V alpha, which is zero by this equation. So the sum of these two terms is zero on the solution. So you only have this term here, minus, minus E alpha W alpha Q. Okay, now, well, you, we, we know what is Q alpha. So we, so, we, so we know what is Q and we write E alpha as tau, so uh, as the tau. So first of all, you can rewrite this Q here as Q in or as tau V, okay? So the first term is here. So you just take Q in 
and you rewrite E alpha as d tau alpha. So you get this integral. So W alpha and Q in are constants. You, you can take them out of the integral and you just have the integral of the tau alpha from the initial to the final time. And in the second term here, uh, well, you have a d tau alpha uh, coming from E alpha and say a tau beta coming from, from here. So you have this uh, uh, now one form, d tau alpha tau beta. And then you have W alpha coming from here and the V beta coming from here. And so these reconstruct this matrix, this matrix A alpha beta. And so you have this, this second term here, okay? Now you can compute this explicitly. So if you now define capital T alpha as tau alpha evaluated at the final endpoint, that is the integral of the alpha from the initial to the final endpoint, then you see that, well, this integral here is just T alpha. And by a simple manipulation, you can see that this other integral is equal to one half of T alpha T beta. So this should be T beta, okay? So now we have explicitly S evaluated on the solution as a function of well, Q in and this variable T alpha. Well, this variable T alpha are exactly the, Q, the group variable in G, in capital G here, okay? Uh, in addition, since we change the polarization, we have to compute this function f, p times q at the final endpoint, that is p out, right? This is the value of p at the final point, times q at t out, which by this formula is q in plus t alpha, v alpha, okay? So when you insert this, uh, you get, uh, well, these two terms here, well, this term and uh, this term with the alpha. And then you add up with the action. So you have this other term here with T alpha and W alpha here. And then you have this last term here. So this is the whole solution, okay? So the hamilton jacobi action for this very simple system as a function of Q in P out and this uh, uh, group uh, variable capital T is just given here. It's P, P out minus P, P out Q in minus T alpha time this uh, linear combination of P out and Q in minus this term that does not depend on the endpoint variable, okay? Actually, in, in this example, we can also make a generic uh, uh, nonlinear change of variables. So namely that we have some uh, generic function F of the variable small Q capital Q, which can be nonlinear in such a way that, uh, well, it generates a symplectomorphism by this formula. Then, uh, well, this part is the same. Right, it's just evaluation of the action on the, on the solution of the evolution equation. And what changes is that, well, now we are just to evaluate this function F at the final endpoint, which is written here. So Q, capital Q out is fixed at the endpoint. And here we just have to compute Q at uh, T out, which is well, precisely Q in plus T alpha V alpha. And so this is a, the solution for a general change of polarization. And actually this formula is, well, essentially the one that you need, for example, for this seven dimensional chain simon theory uh, considered by Gerasimo Shatasvili. This is a, uh, well, the simple solution. What uh, of course is complicated there is this function F, but this is a, the solution. Okay, now let me uh, extend uh, this to uh, some uh, infinite dimensional case in the last few minutes, that is chain simon theory. So uh, let me apply this to, well, extend this to a billion chain simon theory. So a billion simon theory uh, is a three-dimensional field theory with action ADA, where, where A is a one form, okay? Here for simplicity, I just consider this case, okay? Now I assume that my three manifold is of the form an interval cross some two surface. And then I, I, I write my one form A as well, the sigma component and the, the I component. So this means uh, uh, the component that, which is a one form in the sigma direction and this is a component which is a one form in the I direction, but both component depends on variables, both on I and on sigma. I can also split the Durham differential into its two components, and then you can rewrite this action this way. And now here, well, you, well, this DI is a time derivative. So this term is a term that corresponds to PDQ. And here is a term that corresponds to the constraints. So here, well, you see that the PQ variable here are the A sigma. So this sigma and sigma are the constraints and the AI component are the Lagrange multipliers, okay? So here this says that, well, T star Rn is replaced by one forms on sigma and the Lie algebra G, the abelian Lie algebra G is replaced by this AI that is zero forms uh, on sigma. 
Okay, now for our construction, we have to identify the PQ variables this is the choice of polarization. And to do this, we complexify. So we choose a complex structure on sigma, and then we write the complex one form on sigma as one zero form plus zero one form. Okay, so then we can accordingly write a sigma as a one zero plus a zero one, and we can rewrite the D sigma as Dalbo plus uh, Dalbo bar operators. Okay, and then you can rewrite this action this way. So this a sigma di sigma with a factor on half becomes a one zero di a zero one, which is that uh, well, you can say the a zero one are the q variable and a one zero are the p variables, and uh, this other term here, d sigma, can be rewritten this way, and so this gives you the constraints, and you see the constraints are linear in the p and the q variables, and uh, uh, what I called uh, v and w here, these uh, vector and covector here, v and w, right now are just uh, the the bow operator and the double bar operator. Okay. And then, well, you can apply, uh, well, this, this formula uh, here with just some change of notation. Instead of capital T, now I write sigma, and you, you get this formula here. So there is a term linear in sigma, which contains this linear term here and this quadratic term here. Okay, and, uh, and this is the solution. And well, this is the abelian uh, gauge, uh, well, gauge uh, vestimino. Um, well, actually, but there is no vestimino term. Okay, uh, so this is the result. Okay, it's been formal. You, well, you can do it also rigorously. Uh, well, you have to make sense what it means to work with this functional infinite dimensional spaces, with this other generating function on infinite dimensional synthetic space. You, well, you, you can repeat what, uh, well, what I discussed before, before and you get exactly this answer. And you can do well, the same also for seven dimensional Chen Simon theory and with nonlinear change of polarization, and you get uh, the, the, the result, and actually you get the result by Gerasimus and Schottas theory. And now we'll be, uh, so we started uh, yeah, a couple of minutes later, so do, do we have still a couple of minutes? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah I'll okay. So let me briefly discuss the quantum version. Uh, so in the quantum version, um, well, you have to keep track of gauge transformations. So this A transformed by the differential of some zero form. And you do this in this uh, BV setting, namely this, uh, well, essentially you take a cohomological resolution of the gauge transformation, which means that you introduce some additional variable C, uh, some graded variables so on some odd variable and some uh, uh, vector field Q on, on, on the space of fields, which, uh, well, X on the, on the A variable by the gauge transformation generated by C. And so these new, new, your new variables are A and C. And in addition, you introduce their momentum, their momenta, A dagger and C dagger, uh, to get a symplectic manifold, an infinite dimensional symplectic manifold. And well, you shift them. So these A dagger and C dagger had opposite parity and A and C. So this is what is called the BV symplectic uh, manifold. It's a, well, it's a not symplectic manifold. And then uh, you extend your classical action to the so-called BV action, which is the classical action plus this other term, which is essentially the generator of the gauge transformation, which can also be rewritten nicely as just ADA with this new field ABV, which is just the linear combination of the whole of the old four fields. And uh, what is nice is that, uh, that this BV action Poisson commute with itself with respect to this odd symplectic structure. And the BV quantization tells you that if you take the exponential of an action that satisfies this equation and integrate it on the Lagrange uh, Johnson manifold of your odd symplectic manifold, the result is invariant under the formation of the Lagrange Johnson uh, manifold. Okay, so this is a BV theorem. Uh, well, I presented it in a well simplified form. Well, there is some term containing the so-called BV Laplacian that I want to ignore it. Uh, well, to make this more invariant, we have to reduce half densities and so on. But well, for our purposes, it's enough to consider the simplified version. Now, uh, a way to construct a, a Lagrangian sum manifold in this space is by the Lorentz gauge, namely introduce a metric, and then you uh, require A to be uh, in the kernel of the uh, odd star operator D star. You set the C dagger variables to zero, and you require the A dagger variable to be in the image of this star. And this is Lagrangian sum manifold, which allows you to make this computation. Now, if you're working on a manifold with boundary, like our interval cross sigma, uh, then uh, well, you have to do this uh, quantum BV, BV, BV formalism. So I'm not going to uh, do many details. Essentially, 
maybe well, I can skip this. Uh, what happens is that, uh, well, you identify some uh, space of boundary fields, which now no longer contains only the A fields, uh, contain more fields, but still is a sum cotangent bundle. And there is some restriction of, from the bulk field to the boundary fields. And you have to choose a polarization as we did in the classical case, namely you have to represent the space of boundary fields as a cotangent bundle. And I would denote uh, these boundary variables as fat A variable. And then what you do is you write your BV uh, fields, these, uh, um, what is here, these ABV here, as some extension of this boundary variable plus fluctuations, okay? And it turns out that now when you integrate uh, the exponential of the action, right? With the, the fluctuation on some Lagrangian submanifold, you get something that depends only on this boundary variable. And, and this is uh, the, the, well, the quantization, uh, or the, this, well, this is a, the integral kernel we are looking for. Uh, it turns out that, uh, uh, well, now this depends on the choice of this Lagrangian, but uh, the nice thing is that, well, under some assumption, uh, you can construct some uh, co-boundary operator on the space of these boundary fields with two properties. So first of all, this Psi is killed by this co-boundary operator Omega. And second, when you deform this Lagrangian, this Psi changes by a co-boundary. So it's a uh, cohomology class is well-defined. And actually, well, this Omega squares to zero and, and, and that's it. Okay, let me just very quickly tell you what happens in the, if you apply this to, to just abelian chan simon theory. Uh, well, do this splitting, then uh, rewrite uh, this uh, uh, A sigma as A10 plus A01 using the complex structure on sigma and uh, write alpha instead of AI. And then you get this uh, action. Well, you have to add these boundary terms uh, well, to make sense of this, uh, well, to get rid of uh, well, ambiguity in this, in this extension. And then you can just do a Feynman diagram for this. So there is, a, there is this quadratic term here, right? So you have to invert this operator and then you have vertices. So, so, the, so there is the inverse of this operator, which is graphically is denoted by an arrow going from A01 to A10, okay? So this is some way of inverting essentially time derivative so in the, with some gauge fixing. So well, in, in one dimension, this is very, very simple. And uh, in addition, you have vertices. So for example, this alpha DA01 uh, means that you have some D alpha with a possible outgoing arrow because we zero one. Then the second term is some D bar alpha with some incoming arrow from here. And then you have uh, this boundary term, which means that you may have some fat A with a, an outgoing or an incoming boundary. So if you collect all these together, these are well, the possible Feynman diagrams you can get. I'm diagram of all the graphs that you can generate by these rules. Uh, you can compute them and you show that you get exactly, uh, well, these, uh, uh, the integral of these uh, Lagrangian sum manifold gives you exactly the exponential of the hamilton jacobi action with no quantum corrections. Okay, so I think, uh, well, well, and then with this, just some comments, uh, you can do this for non abelian simon theory, I can tell you a few words if there is a question on that. Uh, you can extend these also to any abelian chern simon theory in dimension for L plus three, in particular seven dimensional chern simon theory. And the, resu the result is always, well, for this kind of theory, is that this stays psi with, well, a Lagrangian sum manifold, which is a deformation of one I could see, well, described before, is always the exponential of the Hamilton Jacobi action uh, plus uh, some terms that depends on, on only on the this ghost variable, these C variables. And well, in, in the full, full generality, there could be quantum correction, but for abelian chan simon theory, there are no quantum corrections. Okay, and in particular, it turns out that uh, if you do this computation for the non abelian simon theory, this hamilton jacobi action, that is this phase here, turns out to be gauged less to mean Witten action for uh, these uh, gauge parameters. And for the seven dimensional abelian case, you get back this Kodaira Spencer action. Okay. I think I can uh, stop here. Can we tell you that, well, you can do this also for other uh, quantum field theories, also with the non-trivial Hamiltonians. And of course, uh, then in the quantum version, some consistency condition must be satisfied. So for example, your equivalent momentum map should be quantizable uh, this way by an appropriate star product. And in general, for other kind of field theory, you might have quantum corrections here. Okay, so I think,
uh, I can stop here. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there, are there more questions? I guess Lisa's question was already answered. Questions? Yes. Anton? Uh, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I, uh, I got a little bit confused about your uh, canonical transformation F. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, uh, I understand your computing uh, um, the canonical transformation, uh, which is dictated by the evolution of your system. Mm -hmm. And then you're saying you're composing it with another more or less arbitrary canonical transformation. Yes. yes. So, I mean, like, if I state it provocatively, the composition is an arbitrary canonical transformation. Just, just, just to understand, I mean, how, how it works in practice, right? Because you're composing some very well structured, well, defined canonical transformation, which is the evolution of your system with just, just an arbitrary one. Yes. Right, but then, uh, then what, how, what's the structure that you see in it? Just, just, just to understand. For instance, you said Gerasim of Shatashvili was an example, and there this, this F was it something very, very special, or how, how uh, this you, F works? Well, 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 geometrically, this just means that uh, you are computing the same uh, generating function for your system, yeah. right? But used by using different yeah. Yeah. So this canonical okay. transformation is just uh, related to some change of coordinates. So of course the ch change of changes of coordinates are arbitrary, but uh, well, sometimes you're interested in certain sets of coordinates. So there are some coordinates that uh, are, are, are interesting. Okay, so that, that that's, well, in, of course, uh, yeah, in full generality, you say, okay, I go from some coordinate to some other coordinates. It, it doesn't matter. Well, it's enough to give the, the, the formula for some choice of coordinates, but there are some coordinates that are more important for other reasons. So, for example, the result of Gerasmo Shatashvili, well, the point was to relate coordinate, natural coordinate using the complex structure to these natural Hitchin coordinates using the, the um, Kabiao structure. Okay, thank you. Are there more questions? I actually have some very silly questions. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, when you were saying, there was a slide when you were saying um, um, you're commenting on this equation dh r bar is a linear combination of h, isn't it? And, oh. Which, which, uh, uh, we, we can stop. I didn't it. see that. Oh, so, wait. Before this. No, no, before, like, uh, at the beginning of this. Ah, oh. This yeah, DH. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You just pass it. This one. Yes. Yeah. These conditions. No, uh, um, in, uh, later, like a DH, um, DH, you, you actually just pass it. DH was. Um, ah, here. Yeah, the, the one, yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, it's almost the same. Um, yes. Um, so then you are saying that, um, yeah, I try to understand what, what, what the genre should be, uh, genre should be behind. So you're saying that um, if, if something satisfies this constraint at the initial point, then it satisfies everywhere. Um, well, ge geometrically, just means that uh, you, you move on the course of something. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So is it is a Hamiltonian flow? Um, it is, yeah, it is a Hamiltonian flow. Hamiltonian flow, 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 flow by, the, by, the by, yeah, by the constraints. Okay. But you don't fix well. You don't fix which h alpha is, uh, but of course it's some Hamiltonian flow of the, the h alpha. For some, some combination, linear combination of the H alphas. Okay. I mean, ge geometrically, this equation just means uh, exactly what I depicted here. And it, it's the time so dependent the Hamiltonian. If you start, yeah? if you start on, the, you, you take a point on the coisotropic sum manifold, right? And then you just move by the Hamiltonian flow of the constraints. And then you okay. keep moving on, on the, okay. the coisotropic okay. sum manifold. Okay. Okay. And, and the constraints are one form, so they're time dependent Hamiltonians. Is that right? Uh, no, 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 no. I, uh, I, I take them to be time independent. Yeah, I mean, you could extend to that, no, but these are just, uh, the, the H alpha just function on phase space. I mean, they become uh, time dependent here because you evaluate them on, on, on the path in phase space. 
So these are H alpha in this form are the compositions of the function H alpha on phase space with the path uh, okay. from the interval to, to, to phase space. Ah, uh, uh, the Hamiltonian flow is T star valued. Uh -huh. Is it? Um, the, the, yeah, the, the, the cotangent bundle. So my target is uh, the cotangent bundle of Rn. Right? Mm -hmm. And I have these functions H alpha on T star Rn. So these are some time independent Hamiltonians. Right? And what I'm saying is that here, well, the evolution is, uh, uh, well, the, the Hamiltonian evolution along some linear combination of the H alpha. Of course, yeah, the, the, the whole Hamiltonian is, is a linear combination. Of course, the E alpha are time dependent. Yeah, so if you say, yeah, the, the Hamiltonian in this equation is time dependent, but it's a linear combination of the time independent Hamiltonians H alpha. Okay, but geometrically, this just means that if you take a point on your coisotropic submanifold, and then you take the Hamiltonian vector field of any linear combination of the constraints, this doesn't leave the coisotropic submanifold. So this is another way of characterizing coisotropic submanifold. Okay, so another thing is that, so, so you, the target is always Rn, so it's local or... It's yeah, but that, this was just to simplify the, the discussion, yeah. Uh, it, I mean, you so can extend these also, yeah, to global settings. Uh, global to global setting one. Well, of course, I mean, what, what, well, you, you generalize by by localizing again. Uh, the idea is that well, for the classical uh, situation, uh, well, you, you just pick two points, and work in networks. Of course, uh, I mean, you, well, the idea is that uh, well, your your path, your solution might might leave that that network, but then you just split it. Into, into portions the states in, in nebulous and then, and then just uh, compose them. So the classical level, you just have to compose a canonic generating function of canonical relations. So it's uh, enough to- uh, You patch, you compose them piece by piece. Yes. Oh. So, I mean, the, the, local, the local theory is enough. Mm. Yeah. And for the quantum theory, since we work perturbatively again, uh, well, you, you perturb around some, some solution. And again, if the solution leaves some coordinate neighborhood, you, you first split it and then you compose the results. Okay, so so I think Tabara uh, um, 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 has a has a question. No? Yes, uh, hi Albert. Hi. Uh, did you, I wanted to ask you if you asked uh, if you worked out uh, some examples for other field theories in which the let's say the target has a non-trivial body like the Poisson sigma model. Yes. Or, mm -hmm. In the, what kind of quantum correction do you get? Oh, yeah, for the Poisson sigma model, I think there are quantum corrections. Ah. Yes. And, and for the current sigma model, do you know what I'm even more. Yes. <laughs> yes. I see. Okay, thank you. <laughs> are there more questions? I mean, for, no, for the linear Poisson sigma model, there are no corrections again. That is essentially fits in, in, into these examples, but as soon as the Poisson structure is nonlinear, I expect that, that you should get quantum corrections. Right. Even even for a for a cylinder. I think so. Well, we haven't done the computation, but uh, yeah, I would be surprised. I mean, of course, the Poisson structure is nonlinear, but uh, the constraints are linear in the in the say the eta fields. Right. So that, that might be a simplification. So. Maybe that that uh, helps. Okay, and in the case that you didn't uh, uh, detail that uh, what, when you have, for example, Chern Simons on a non abelian, mm -hmm. uh, so these these things that you were calling group variables become actual group elements like biolonomy or something. Yes, actually, maybe I can show you. Well, without going to computation, essentially, if you well do the Feynman diagrams. For non abelian Chen Simon theory, they are similar to the ones I described here for the abelian one. But now, we, well, you have some vertices. Actually, in this case of a cylinder, it turns out that you only can only have some bivalent vertices. Uh -huh. So, in addition, so this means that in just, instead of having just 
this very simple diagram joining two fat A's together or some D alpha and D bar alpha or some D bar, D bar alpha with some boundary variables. Now you can have longer trees because you have these bivalent vertices and you can also have uh, loops. Okay. Mm. Now, all these trees produce the, the hamilton jacobi action for St. Simon's theory, which is a, a gauge of Vesdomino Witten. And uh, these loops turns out to vanish. Uh, uh, well, if you restrict them to, to the, well, to Gauss number zero fields, the physical fields, mm -hmm. but they have some contribution for the Gauss. Okay. Uh -huh. so, so the result is here is that uh, the, 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 well, the, in the case of a notability and Simon theory, don't get just the exponential of uh, the uh, Hamilton Jacobi action, but there is this additional correction that depends on the ghost. Okay? Mm -hmm. But actually, uh, this correction goes away if you make a change of variables. Actually, if you now uh, choose as uh, your gauge invariant variable uh, exactly the, the group variable ar arising from your Lagrange multiplier, and let me the parallel transport. Yeah. And you make uh, the, the change of variables. And well, you remember that the result is a half density as it should be in, uh, mm -hmm. in BV. So you make the change of variable for a half density. It turns out that the result uh, well, becomes proportional to the hard measure, which you regard as a half density on the odd cotangent bound of, of your D group. Well, this is the infinite dimensional group. And the coefficient is uh, the, the exponential of the Hamilton Jacobi action. So the, 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 the quantum correction disappear if you, if you choose the correct variables. I see. So in a sense, these wheels were- Well, these wheels the, are just the Jacobian of the, the exponential. Right, right, yeah, of the exponential. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, more questions? If no more questions, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> So we we'll see each other next week. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. bye. bye.